In a place called Transylvania, a creature of consummate evil has survived half a millennia and shows no signs of declining. He began as a medieval prince, and the castles from which he reigned tell a tale of unspeakable horror. Join us as we explore the harrowing haunts of Vlad Tepish, the real-life inspiration for Bram Stoker's Dracula, next on Great Castles of Europe. Romania's Carpathian Mountains. This chilling wilderness on Europe's eastern frontier marks the border of a kingdom caught between history and horror. It used to be known as the land beyond the forest, Transylvania. Here since the Middle Ages, stories of supernatural evil have thrived among its peasants, of a devil who grows stronger through abominable acts and a region of darkness untouched by God. In the late 19th century, the Irish writer Bram Stoker became fascinated by these rumors. Trying to give this evil a name, he came to Transylvania. According to many accounts, he traced the rumors to the town of Brashov and a fortress of mysterious beauty known as Braun Castle. The locals refer to Braun as Dracula's castle. Since Stoker's novel was first published in 1897, droves of tourists have sought the creature's origins here. Romanian travel guides encourage it. For lovers of the macabre, the castle has become a site of homage. Yet the troubled spirit connected to this place is far more peculiar than most vampire seekers know. In life, his haunts included several castles. Among them, Braun is guilty by association, but mostly untainted by evil. The same cannot be said of the human inspiration for Stoker's Prince of Darkness. He was Vlad Tepish, literally Vlad the Impaler. In the middle of the 15th century, he was the Prince of Wallachia, a small buffer state caught up in the vicious wars between Hungary and the Ottoman Empire of the Turks. For a time, this Wallachian prince was a hero, a medieval knight commended by the Pope himself for repelling the heathen invaders who threatened Europe. Yet history remembers him as a crusader whose time had passed, and for a reign of terror more disturbing than fiction. Vlad Tepish was born in Transylvania in 1431, the year Joan of Arc was burned at the stake the twilight of the Age of Crusades. He was heir to the throne of neighboring Wallachia in a lineage founded by his grandfather, Mercha the Great, crowned in 1386. From the tender age of seven, Vlad was tutored in the discipline of knighthood and the obligations of the Wallachian crown. His father had been named a Knight of the Order of the Dragon by the Holy Roman Emperor, for this, he bore the name Dragon, or Dracu. As his son, Vlad was sworn from birth to take up the sword for Christ. For nobles in these decades of peril, knighthood was no quaint tradition. It meant survival itself.
the fearless horsemen of the Ottoman sultans swept steadily west in a chain of victory seemingly destined to swallow Europe. In 1453, the death knell of Christendom would roar across the continent, the fall of Constantinople. At just 14, Vlad himself was captured by the dreaded Turks while on a campaign across the Danube. For four long years, the boy was held to ensure an end to his father's raids. From his captors, Vlad learned contempt for life and the many uses of terror. With Dracul's son in chains, Wallachia was a mere stepping stone to the great empire of Hungary. The Ottomans raided its rich trade routes, preparing for their final thrust into Europe. Under the Muslim sword, all of Wallachia cried out for a savior. Brasov was the region's greatest prize, the crossroads for all trade passing between Europe and Asia Minor. In 1395, Vlad's own grandfather Mercia had won Brasov the right to charge a 3% tax on goods coming through the pass. From this tariff, Brasov's class of German merchants grew rich. In charge of enforcing the tariff and protecting the trade route was the magnificent castle Braun. Braun began as a crusader's fortress, built in the 12th century to repel Muslim invaders, using Brasov Pass to break through to Europe. Its life as a toll castle began with Mercia, who presented the fortress to Brasov, Transylvania. Oh, Bronze soldiers guarded passage of trade and collected the town's share of revenue. A constant stream of cotton, spices, and produce ensured Brasov's prosperity. Despite havoc wrought by the Turks, the town's rich merchants, called boyars, grew arrogant and greedy under the protection of imposing brawn. Befitting its role as a soldier's garrison, Braun has an interior that is stately and spartan. The ground plan consists of four towers around an irregularly shaped courtyard. No more than 30 soldiers lived here at a time. In emergencies, a larger army could be mobilized from Brasov. To protect those inside, the roofs of the inner courtyard are steeply sloped. Enemy artillery was deflected away instead of penetrating the living quarters. The chaotic layout of bronze towers and multi-level battlements derives from the castle's foundation it was shaped to fit the rock on which the castle is built. The living mountain extends into Braun itself, remodeled in more recent times to serve as a vacation home for Romanian royalty. But Braun was too isolated. It probably held too many memories of the other royal family who controlled it 600 years ago. This is the document with which Vlad Tepish's grandfather, Mercia, granted power and privileges to Brasov and its protector, Castle Braun. In 1456, after years of imprisonment and exile, Wallachia's princely protector was about to take the throne. Vlad Tepish's coronation took place here, at the ruined castle Turgovista, Wallachia's capital and power center for the heirs of Mercia the Great. In the castle's great hall, Vlad, like his father and grandfather before him, was crowned Prince of Wallachia. High Christian pomp accompanied the crowning. From his ancestral palace, Turgovista, Vlad would carry out most of his reign.
Now, as the knight accepted the crown, the Turkish menace was at its peak. Vlad would become a folk hero in Wallachia for making the Turks pay for their crimes. But before launching his holy war, the prince had a grudge to settle with the region's aristocratic boyars. In his view, their influence threatened Wallachia's independence. He invited them to a celebration. The region's most prominent citizens attended, imagining that the young monarch sought their favor. Spirits ran high as they toasted their new puppet prince. Vlad had other plans. Accompanied by his personal army, he led the old and infirm to a public square. There, his soldiers impaled them on stakes driven into the ground. Before the elders had died from the excruciating torture, he forced the younger boyars, both men and women, on a 50-mile march to this eagle's nest high in the Carpathians. With them, Vlad made a human chain reaching from the Arjus River to the site of the now ruined castle Poyanar. There, his grandfather, Mercha, had built a foundation. With the nobles as slave labor, Vlad completed it. By then, 200 boyars would all be dead, impaled, killed by frost, or fallen from the Carpathian summit. As his reign began, Poyanar was Vlad's hideout, manned by soldiers numbering in the hundreds. Its walls were reinforced with brick to withstand cannon fire from the enemies he would make as prince. Now just 25, Vlad's plans for Wallachia and himself were truly visionary. From his castle strongholds, the courageous prince intended to win Wallachian independence from the empires that dominated it, Hungary and the Ottoman Turks. A free nation would emerge, unlike any in Europe, until the Middle Renaissance. The prince, whose official seals are seen here, would be accepted as a great European ruler. Wallachia would be free of its tormentors. Central to Vlad's goal were commercial toll castles like Braun. For Vlad, the revenue they protected was the other key to his small kingdom's independence. Vlad enforced law and order on the region's trade routes by punishing thieves with impalement. His use of terror began to seem arbitrary, even sadistic. Within 50 years, the Italian Niccolo Machiavelli would coach European monarchs in the judicious use of violence with his book, The Prince. Some claim Tepish was the inspiration for the classic treatise on power. But Machiavelli never went this far. Around 1458, Tepish began the years of raids that brought him fame as the Cross's staunchest defender. His personal war against the Turks was characterized by lightning attacks, reckless bravery in battle, and savagery that awed allies and foes alike. At the start of this era, Pope Pius II praised the Christian Crusaders' successes. By its end, Rome and the civilized world had distanced themselves from the uncontrollable prince on their frontier. In 1961, after a raid on the Turkish fortress Giurgiu, Vlad took thousands of Turks prisoner. These, along with up to 20,000 Germans, Bulgarians, and even Wallachians, he impaled on high stakes near his capital, Turgovista. When the Ottoman Sultan Mohammed II arrived for battle months later, the horrifying forest of corpses was still there. He turned his armies around, saying, what can we do against a man capable of this?
By 1460, the Turks had a special name for the son of Dracul, Kaziklube, the Impaler. Yet the prince's excesses weren't saved for Turks alone. He impaled foreign ambassadors for imagined insults, German students accused of spying, lovers for alleged infidelity. By the end of his reign, he'd murdered 100,000 of his own countrymen, a full one-fifth of the Wallachian population. One harrowing account is backed by Russian, German, and Romanian sources. According to them, Vlad invited hundreds of Wallachian sick and poor to a lavish banquet near Turgovista. When the prince asked what else would please them, they answered, relief from our pain and want. Vlad ordered the hall locked from outside and set on fire. By 1462, King Matthias of Hungary had heard enough. Wallachia was a principality in his domain. The impaler was his burden. He ordered his generals to seize Tepish at any cost. But now Vlad was headed for them. With a small band of followers, he had fled Wallachia and was on the run to Transylvania with the legions of Mohammed the Conqueror hard on his heels. They crossed the Danube, then this bluff, their horses shod backwards to throw off pursuers. Tepish, no doubt, was overjoyed to see the armies of his old ally, Matthias. He may even have thought they had come as reinforcements. Instead, they put the madman in chains. He was imprisoned somewhere in Transylvania, perhaps even Braun Castle. His second internment lasted 12 years, and during this time, the trail of Vlad Tepish, the historical Dracula, grows dim. Historical records indicate he returned to the throne to help Matthias repel another wave of Ottoman invaders. Other sources claim he died in his mountain prison or escaped. At Braun Castle, he might have used one of the fortress's little-known features, a secret passage Vlad copied at his castle, Poyanar. In Braun's inner courtyard, Hidden beneath a well is a steep staircase. If Vlad used it, he would have emerged in the forest below the castle. This could account for atrocities attributed to him during his years in prison and long after his supposed death. It's likely that Vlad died as he lived around 1477 in a final battle against the Turks. His head, some claim, was sent to the Sultan, proof that the Impaler was dead. But because of his deeds in life, Wallachians had a hard time accepting his death. Rumors of his nocturnal murders continued. Soon the legend of the Impaler merged with tales of that particularly Eastern European creature, the Vampire. Long before Vlad's time, peasants strung garlic from the doors of their homes. Burial sites were surrounded by stakes to ensure safety from a rapacious evil that survived beyond the grave. German publishers fueled the Impaler's fame. As early as 1499, pamphlets appeared recounting the prince's barbarity against Wallachia's boyars. 
By now, the Impaler had taken on the chilling name he's known by today, Dracula, meaning both son of Dracul and the devil. Not even the prince's burial brought relief to the region's peasantry. This is Shnagov Lake in Wallachia, now Romania. On its uninhabited island, just one structure exists, a monastery containing the tomb of Dracula. At the height of his career, Dracula had the monastery erected that it might somehow atone for his sins. Inside is a single grave, horrifyingly empty. In this century, repeated excavations have turned up only fragments. The implications are all too clear. According to legend, on the day he was buried, a fierce storm raged. The wind tore the chapel from its foundation and blew it into the lake. To this day, peasants say that whenever the waters of Shnagov get agitated, one can hear the chapel bell tolling at the bottom of the lake. This is what Braun Castle looked like in the years Bram Stoker could have seen it, as the 19th century shuddered to a close. If Stoker used Braun as a model for Dracula's castle, he exaggerated its features, but captured its essence. His character, Jonathan Harker, writes, all of a sudden, I was aware that the driver was holding the horses on the court of a vast ruin of a castle. We saw it in all its grandeur, perched a thousand feet on the summit of a sheer precipice. There was something wild and uncanny about the place. Stoker's genius lay in reuniting Romanian and German folk tales with their source, the historical Dracula. Were it not for the novel's phenomenal success, Stoker and his other tales of horror might have remained anonymous. Yet it is hard to believe that the otherworldly character of this part of Romania would have stayed out of sight forever. Somehow the legacy of the medieval Wallachian prince would have exerted itself. Bram Stoker's Professor von Helsing describes the vampire in terms that make a fitting epitaph for the real-life Prince of Darkness. The undead do not die like a bee when he sting once. His cunning be the growth of ages. He is only stronger, and being stronger has yet more power to work evil. the castle of fear. For centuries, these imposing walls stood at the bloody border separating East and West, silent witness to the struggle of Christianity and Islam. Within this mighty fortress, history unfolded amid arrogance, incest, and intrigue, as did legends of evil queens and grisly scenes of death. Listen to the echoes of Forkenstein's past, next on Great Castles of Europe.
From this sweeping vantage in the foothills of Austria's Rosalia Range near Vienna, one can survey the fertile lands that extend into bordering Hungary and Slovakia, lands bloodily contested as far back as human memory serves. Legend says that Attila, with his frightful armies of wild Huns, passed this way. He looked out from this strategic point with thoughts of building a fortress, perhaps inspired by the ruin of a Roman watchtower that still forms the cornerstone of the Black Tower. The tower today is white. It's naturally dark rock plastered over during the last century. Any proof of Attila's fortress has disappeared in the mists of time. The first castle of written history belonged to the mighty counts of Mottersdorf. In the 1300s, they ruled over these lands. The castle's now gone, ordered demolished by Albrecht, ruler of Austria, who sought to extend his power to this area. The exact location of this castle is disputed. A recent theory suggests it stood here, just across from present-day Forkdenstein. After signing a Pledge of Allegiance to the mighty Albrecht, the defeated counts were allowed to build again. Their new 14th century castle was bigger, stronger, and more impressive than its predecessor. They named it Forkdenstein, the Castle of Fear. At the castle's centerpiece stood a central tower 50 feet wide with walls 23 feet thick. Any attacker would be foolish to attempt to conquer its inhabitants. If by chance the outer walls were breached, this would be the final setting for victory or death. But until that day, the tower would serve as a lookout and the birthplace of grim legends. The grisly reputation of the Black Tower was fed in part by the legend of Queen Rosalia, who ruled with an iron fist whenever her king was away at war. She dispatched her enemies by throwing them into the tower's pit of oblivion to die. When King Giletus, aware of his wife's behavior, returned to Forkenstein, he told her a story of a mighty and bad queen he had met during the war. He asked, what would you do to a queen like that? Rosalia, thinking she could escape his rage, replied, I would sentence her to die in the pit of oblivion. And the king responded, You have just spoken your own sentence. The queen was brought to the black tower, let down in the pit to dangle over the corpses of her victims and starve to death herself. Guards loved to tease Rosalia and would approach the pit and call out her name. Her anguished replies to their taunts grew fainter. After seven days, the cries stopped, and when the guards called her name, they heard only their echo. But according to legend, her ghost was spotted circling the Black Tower, a tormented spirit that could not find peace. King Giletus then built a chapel on top of the hill overlooking Forkenstein, where Rosalia's soul came to rest. Then, the legend goes, Rosalia became a saint, someone to pray to in times of plague. And so the mountains that surround the castle were named to honor her. It's a good legend, though not a speck of it is true. Instead, a story conjured up in the 1800s by the castle's owner at the time. These mountains were named for a real Saint Rosalia who lived in Italy in the 12th century and was credited with miracles during times of plague here and in other parts of Europe. But the pit of oblivion is real. It still lies at the bottom of the Black Tower. Centuries ago, criminals saw their last days here, inside a 40-foot deep chamber of death. Sent into this oblivion, they surely went mad. But whatever stories they had died with them, their names and faces quickly forgotten.
Even the extensive records of Forkenstein don't mention these dead. Only the funds used to buy rope for lowering convicts into the pit were neatly recorded. During the 17th century, Forkenstein came into the hands of an ambitious nobleman, a gift, in fact, from the Habsburg Empire. Earlier that century, the Turks of the Ottoman Empire, always a threat to the Habsburgs, began a march on Vienna. They were joined by rebellious Hungarian aristocrats who saw a chance to break away from the Habsburgs and create an independent kingdom of Hungary. But one nobleman refused to join the Turks, choosing to stay loyal to the Austrian emperor. The Turks took his castle as a result. When the march on Vienna was brought to a standstill, the nobleman was handsomely rewarded for his loyalty. Austria's Emperor Ferdinand II granted the nobleman the wealthy town of Eisenstadt and the great castle of Forkenstein. The contract was signed on January 24, 1622, and bears the signature of Nicholas Esterhazy, the first of a long line of Esterhazys to own the castle to the present day. Nicholas Esterhazy, who started out as a peasant nobleman, fed his ambitions through convenient marriages with rich widows. His marriages yielded enormous tracts of land in Hungary and Austria. His first wife, Ursula Durfsey, possessed large counties with hereditary rights, and this brought Esterhazy the rank of magnate. His second wife, Christina Nijari, also held great lands and many commodities. The Esterhazys were soon viewed as the first family of Hungary. Nicholas Esterhazy found his 14th century castle a bit out of date with 16th century style and began an extensive modernization campaign. In 1635, the castle was largely demolished under the supervision of Italian architect Ritacco. Only the infamous Black Tower remained untouched. Throughout the rest of the castle, windows were added, walls strengthened, and firearms increased. Nicholas Esterhazy and his children joined the builders, forming a chain to transport rocks to the building site. The rebuilding took some 80 years. The great well of Forkenstein, a staggering 469 feet deep, was dug by Turkish prisoners. The well provided water when the castle was beleaguered, so it was of great strategic importance. Prisoners of war manned the tread wheel that brought up the buckets. An easier job, certainly, than the prisoners before them who had to cut the well out of hard rock face. With the Esterhazys now members of the highest aristocratic rank, they needed to maintain regiments of five to eight thousand men. These armies stood at the ready, available to the emperor at all times, and when the alarm sounded, the soldiers marched from Forkenstein under the orders of the imperial generals. Nicholas Esterhazy used his armies to fight the great Turks, who constantly threatened the Catholic Empire of Austria. Victories scored on the battlefield were followed with bloody consequences. Plundering, raping, and a myriad assortment of tortures were popular. Armies used a scorched earth policy, raising everything found in their paths. The Esterhazy sons trained as soldiers and joined the army as soon as they were old enough. When Nicholas died in 1645, his 19-year-old son, Laudislaw, took command of the Esterhazy regiments. Battles brought prisoners of war to Forkenstein. One prisoner, named Hussein, was so paralyzed by homesickness he could not do any work. Laudislaw 
perhaps in a burst of compassion, set the man free. He would live to regret it. Years later, at a siege at the town of Vezekin, a thousand Christian troops desperately fended off some 4,000 Turks. When the battle finished, nearly 2,000 Turks lay dead. The losses on the Christian side were small, but cut deep. 76 footmen were dead, along with them four noblemen, all of them Esterhasis, including Laudislaw. Laudislaw had been shot by a lowly Turk footman named Hussein. Hussein, realizing he had just killed his benefactor, wept in grief, then killed himself. Paul Esterhazy, Laudislaw's 17-year-old brother, was left in charge of the family's wealth. Paul was an interesting character in the Esterhazy dynasty, the subject of a rather peculiar family tree. His father, Nicholas, in trying to strengthen hereditary lines, wanted Paul to marry his own step-niece, a 12-year-old named Ursula. During this age of aristocracy, inbreeding was considered normal, and some noblemen, including Nicholas, deemed it necessary, a way to keep hard-won property in the family. The Catholic Church, however, forbade incest, and the Pope, after meeting with the Esterhazys, refused to sanction the marriage. Undaunted, the Esterhazys recruited one of the Pope's maids for help. No one's sure what happened next. Even legend doesn't offer an explanation, but whatever the maid did, it worked. The Pope granted dispensation quickly. Paul and Ursula had 18 children. After Ursula's death, Paul had seven more with his second wife, Eva. But of his 25 children, only eight survived, leaving Paul with a family tree not as firmly rooted as he would have liked. Paul's loyalty to the Austrian emperor was sorely tested in 1667. Paul was tempted into treason by his neighbor, the Count of Pottendorf, who lorded over a large dominion but wanted his own republic. Paul was invited to join this enterprise, lured by the promise of being named king of this new country. After signing the necessary treaty, Paul left the room, leaving his hat on the table to show his conspirators that he would return. In fact, Paul Esterhazy mounted his horse and rushed back to Forkenstein. When the other men proudly looked at Esterhazy's signature, they realized they had been cheated. Paul had just signed something illegible, choosing, in the end, to remain loyal to his emperor. The plotters pursued Paul. Just before Forkenstein, they nearly caught up with him. Paul clattered across the drawbridge to safety. Like every medieval castle, Forkenstein acted as a fortress, much to the dismay of later generations of Esterhazys who did not take to its isolation in the mountains. After Paul Esterhazy died, the family used Forkenstein only as an arsenal and vault for valuable family properties and papers. Normally, Forkenstein housed some 200 people, caretakers who lived in the small houses in the lower part of the castle. The main building would lie empty, waiting for the next visit from the Esterhazy family and their often extensive entourage. One visit could bring as many as 45 guests and at least 16 horses. Still, the visits were sporadic. The castle didn't offer much except its hunting grounds. Its thick walls kept the interior cold and damp. There were no modern comforts, no sprawling gardens. The city held the lure of a more elegant and luxurious life. In its more than 600 years, Forkenstein's walls have never been breached. The castle was designed and built so well that attackers never even considered trying to conquer it. 
Taking the castle would have required extraordinary tactical skill or remarkable patience. There were several approaches to take, though most of them fruitless. The castle rests on a solid rock overlooking most of the surrounding area. On the hills around it, only low brush was allowed to grow, providing a clear view of an advancing enemy. The castle would be most easily approached from the mountains. From this position, the invaders could throw firebombs inside the castle perimeters. Not that they could do much harm. The Black Tower was the central defensive structure. With walls 23 feet thick and a diameter stretching 50 feet across, the tower could easily deflect enemy boulders launched from the mountains. If the invaders were feeling confident, or perhaps foolish, they might dispatch small forces to approach the castle. Some might enter the moat, perhaps to plant a fire mine beneath the castle. A good idea, except that their every move could be seen from the castle platform. Certainly they could never get inside the castle's front door. A drawbridge would abruptly put an end to any enemy advancement. Other infantrymen might have tried less obvious approaches, such as attempting to scale the outer walls. Not a cautious move, for in those days there were no trees surrounding the castle, and the steep rock and exposure would turn any invasion into a mission of suicide. The only practical choice would be to sit and wait and let time flush the castle dwellers out. Time could mean months, though, or even years, for the defenders had huge stockpiles of food and the castle didn't need many protectors. It could hold its own, a low-maintenance fortress. Forktenstein's architecture reflects the practical defensive design of its day. It was never intended to be a pleasure palace, but a castle in the true medieval sense, a stronghold. As the spoils of war flooded in from battles between the Habsburg dynasty, Napoleon and the Prussians, Forktenstein grew into the largest arsenal in Europe. When the Habsburg dynasty ended in 1918, the Esterhazys stayed in place, maintaining a small private army to protect the castle and its lands until Hitler invaded Austria in 1938. By then, the castle had long lost its military significance. Although Forkenstein was still an arsenal, modern firearms had rendered the castle obsolete. To the modern-day attacker equipped with tanks and rockets, the castle of fear no longer lived up to its mighty name. Today, the castle is still owned by the Esterhazy family, though the last direct descendant died in 1989. A foundation now controls the extensive possessions and has opened the castle to the public. The castle we can enjoy today looks much as it did in the 1600s. The only significant change, electricity and water installed in the main building in 1992. Though anyone today can explore the pits and passages of this considerable castle, there's one place that remains off limits, the treasure room. According to the Esterhazy family, most of their treasures were transferred to the National Museum in Budapest when the communists took over. Still, the Countess of Esterhazy will not allow entrance to the room under any conditions. So at least one secret of Forktenstein remains untold.
in a Scottish valley of sloping meadows and wild woods, where pagan magic met Christian canon. There stands a royal castle filled with ghostly secrets and tragic tales. Here are legends to inspire Shakespeare, where medieval and Victorian worlds collide in a dazzling display of history. Tour these haunted halls of mystery, Glom's Castle, on the next great castles of Europe. Some 1,200 years ago, a lone missionary crossed the rich red soil of the Scottish valleys. His name was Fergus, come from Ireland, the land of St. Patrick. Much about this holy wanderer is lost in the dim record of ancient history, but this much is known. Fergus took his Christian teachings through this land, where he encountered people of a pagan kingdom, we call them the Picts, Latin for the painters. They were one of the most powerful groups to settle Scotland. Memorial stones and crosses mark their existence and reveal their Celtic roots. Striking examples of Pictish relics are found in the village of Gloms. Most notable is the man's standing stone, whose entwined creatures may represent a family emblem or the meeting of Christianity and pagan tradition. Fergus's journey ended here, at the border of the Glam's Burn, part of a gentle, fertile valley of Strathmore, a prosperous holding of the Pictish kingdom. The year was 710 A.D. Here, the missionary's message was well received. He soon founded a church, and word spread of his teachings. The ranks of the converted quickly swelled. Legend says Fergus, who would one day be sainted, baptized many at a site along the river. A well placed there was named for him. Gloms would, for a time, be a place of pilgrimage. As the centuries passed, Christianity took hold here and across Scotland. At Gloms, the pilgrimages ended. As a holy place, its time had passed. But as a playground for kings, it was just beginning. Gloms' rich woodlands and gentle glens were full of deer and wild boar. For Scottish monarchs, it proved an irresistible hunting ground. Thus begins the history of Gloms Castle. Its humble start was as an 11th century hunting lodge, made simply of earth and timber. As the centuries passed, the simple structure would acquire an architectural complexity and a ghoulish reputation. Here, William Shakespeare found the characters and the setting for his tale of ruthless ambition the tragedy Macbeth. The castle resonates with the history of Macbeth. Legend says his grandfather Malcolm, an 11th century Scottish king, was murdered here. In truth, King Malcolm did die at Gloms, but probably from wounds sustained while hunting deer. In Shakespeare's tragedy, Macbeth slew his first cousin, King Duncan, to seize the Scottish crown. Here, the supposed scene of that crime, King Duncan's Hall, named for the grisly event. 
History, however, tells us a different story. Macbeth did kill his cousin, but miles away from Glam's castle, and under circumstances more honorable than those portrayed by Shakespeare. The real Macbeth and King Duncan met on the field of battle near Elgin in the year 1040. They broke away from the others to begin a duel to the death. Macbeth not only wanted Duncan's crown, he also wanted vengeance. Years before, Duncan's grandfather had murdered Macbeth's brother-in-law. The blood feud ran deep. It ran deeper still with the death of Duncan. Such were the days of a turbulent young Scotland when no slight between noble families went unpunished. Clan hostilities persisted for centuries. After killing Duncan, Macbeth in turn met his end at the hands of Duncan's son in the year 1057. Macbeth is buried here on the Isle of Iona in a graveyard richly planted with Scottish monarchs. He shares his resting place with King Robert II. It was Robert who placed Glam's castle in private hands by granting it to Sir John Lyon in 1372. Four years later, Sir John fortified his good graces with the king by marrying his daughter, Joanna. The Lyon family would play prominently throughout royal Scottish history and live in Glam's castle to its present day. For a time, life treated the Lyon family generously. They amassed great wealth and power. But tragedy soon stained the castle walls. The tragedy produced a ghost called the Grey Lady. Her tormented soul and the memory of a terrible deed haunt Glam's castle to this day. The Grey Lady is said to be the ghost of Lady Glam's, who died in 1540. She was brutally killed, the target of an unchecked hatred by an obsessed Scottish king, King James V. James was the last of the Catholic Scottish kings and the leader in Scotland's struggle for independence against England. But he was also a bitter, lonely soul. Frequently, James eased his alienation by escaping to the woods dressed in disguise to seek the company of gypsies and tramps. His habits earned him the nickname King of Commons. There, among his poorer subjects, James often sought solace in the arms of a woman. But sympathy for the monarch comes hard in light of his cruelty. The full force of his vindictive nature fell on the Scottish clan Douglas, the clan to which his much abhorred stepfather belonged. So deep was his hatred of his stepfather that James vowed to cleanse Scotland of the Douglas name. The castle at that time was in the hands of Lady Gloms, widow of the sixth Lord of Gloms. Her former name was Janet Douglas, a member of the Douglas clan. James charged Lady Gloms with witchcraft, and she was condemned to burn at the stake. The Scots were shocked and dismayed at what had befallen this much admired woman. It said that all those present at the hideous scene of her death bowed their heads in shame. Heaping insult upon injury, James moved into Glam's castle and appropriated its belongings. The king would live here for four years. But James's boundless cruelty eventually alienated his nobles and his armies. The rest of the king's reign was a chronicle of failure. His forces turned mutinous, and he was soundly defeated trying to invade England. James died shortly thereafter.
At Glom's, his coat of arms still rests above the front door. After James's death, steps were taken to redress the injustices rendered during his reign. Lady Glom's was posthumously proved innocent of witchcraft, and the Glom's estate restored to the Lyon family. In a final act of reconciliation, James's teenage daughter visited Glom's castle in 1562. Her name was Mary, Queen of Scots. The visit restored the bond between the Lyon family and the Scottish monarchy, and Mary strengthened a weak link among her nobles. She needed their support to stay balanced between Scotland's factious Protestants and Catholics. Glam's present-day look is largely due to the efforts of Patrick, the third Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn. Building on work begun by his grandfather, Patrick gave the castle a 17th century facelift and initiated a number of ambitious constructions. But Patrick had also inherited a host of problems, a castle sorely in need of repairs, and a debt of 400,000 pounds. Patrick's father had squandered the family fortune by financing part of Scotland's Bishop Wars. But Patrick, whose business acumen belies his rather whimsical way of dress, restored both the family fortune and the castle. He shored up his finances in part by acquiring capital, or cattle. Cattle breeding was a revolutionary idea at Glom's, but one that proved quite lucrative. These cash cows eventually bankrolled the castle's reconstruction. Patrick's remodeling campaign filtered into every crevice of the castle. Among his numerous additions and alterations, Patrick raised the central tower to new heights. and built the avenue that leads to the front door. When Patrick was finished, the castle displayed a unique blend of Scottish and French sensibilities, a melange of Norman-inspired turrets surrounding the classic Scottish tower house. But despite the charm and aesthetic appeal of Glom's, Patrick took an unassuming, even apologetic approach to his marvelous reconstruction efforts. In his diary, he expressed remorse for not seeking the counsel of a true architect and offered repeated apologies if his own architectural vision had gone awry in any way. But that is a part of the delight of Glom's, that it is a castle with real soul, a reflection of one man's sensitivities and quirks. Small flourishes, such as this wonderful Baroque sundial, celebrate his spirit and style. In that sense, Glom's has an organic quality the result of which is pure Patrick. He had transformed Glom's from a debt-ridden structure into one of the richest estates in Scotland. The newfound wealth allowed the Lyon family to enter one of the most turbulent chapters in Scottish and English history, the Jacobite Rebellion. It was an uprising that centered on who held the right to be King of England and Scotland. James II, the original king, had been forced into exile following the Glorious Revolution of 1688. Those who supported James and his descendants were called the Jacobites. They wanted to restore the Stuarts to the throne and launched a guerrilla campaign that would last for 60 years. Right, leave us one! The Lyon family sided with the Jacobites and paid dearly for it. John, the fifth Earl, was killed in battle in 1715. At one point, Glom's castle played host to Prince James III, the new symbol of the Jacobite rebellion following his father's death in exile. But in the end, the Jacobite movement proved unsuccessful. Ending in the definitive Battle of Culloden in 1745, its political character soon replaced with harmless sentiment. Any traces of ill will toward England soon vanished from Glam's, 
when an important marriage followed that established bloodlines between the Scottish Lyon family and England. In 1767, John Lyon, the ninth Earl of Strathmore, married an Englishwoman of great stature, Mary Bowes. Above the fireplace in the drawing room, the entwined thistles of Scotland and the roses of England symbolize the union between two countries and two families. Life at the castle continued to prosper. In time, the family took the name of Bowes Lyon and acquired a seat in the House of Lords. Stepping into the modern world, the Bowes Lyon family represented all that was prominent and proper, the archetype of British aristocracy, a hundred years away from its revolutionary past. But the crowning glory arrived in the 20th century when a family member entered the realm of English royalty. On a wall in the dining room, a portrait reveals part of this royal connection. The woman seated is Countess Nina Cecilia Cavendish Bentinck. She came to live at Glam's after marrying the 14th Earl of Strathmore. One day she would be a famous grandmother her granddaughter, a certain Queen of England. The Countess's bedroom, just as it looked at the turn of the century. This was her canopy bed. On the bed's pelment, she hand-embroidered the letter C, C for Cecilia and C for her husband, Claude, followed by the names and dates of birth of her ten children. Her youngest, Elizabeth. What became of Elizabeth? this lovely woman who held a certain twinkle in her eye. She eventually married, had children, and became the Queen Mother. Glam's, in fact, is the Queen Mother's childhood home, this Italian garden, her playground. In the billiard room, among the glorious and rare tapestries, a teenage Elizabeth nursed wounded soldiers during World War I. The room had been temporarily converted into a hospital ward. This was the Queen Mother's private suite after she married. And it was in this part of the castle that she gave birth to Princess Margaret, the first time in 300 years a royal baby in line for the English throne was born in Scotland. Amid the celebrated joys and triumphs of Glam's, an eerie air still cloaks the castle. Stories heard here hint of dark secrets of the past. Many spring from a secret chamber thought to lie deep within the bowels of the crypt. One legend says this chamber is the home of a vampire, the unfortunate product of a family curse. The vampire pops up periodically in the family and hangs about for a few centuries, requiring a lengthy imprisonment behind this wall. Another version has a family member of limited repute playing cards in the chamber on the Sabbath, his partner, the devil himself. 
together they made such a racket the room was finally covered and sealed. The only clue to the chamber's existence, an outside window, covered up and barred over. Other visitors from the netherworld are said to walk the castle halls, peer out of windows, and trip the unwitting visitor. The castle's forbidding feel has provoked unease in not a few guests. A celebrated visitor, Sir Walter Scott, was prompted to write that while at Gloms he felt himself too far from the living and somewhat too near the dead. Hebrides Isles of Scotland. Here a millennia ago, Celt magic and the Vikings warrior spirit combined to form a new fearsome race, the mighty Highland clans. From island castles like Duart and Dunvegan, the clans waged war against the Scottish crown and each other. Explore the fighting history of two castles and the Highland dynasties who made them strong, next on Great Castles of Europe. Islands off Scotland's western coast. From the lone shieling of the misty island, mountains divide us and the waste of seas. But still the blood is strong, the heart is highland, and we in dreams behold the Hebrides. Through the centuries, their stark, majestic shores have drawn wave upon wave of settlers. Together they grew into the fierce rebel dynasties we know as the Highland Clans. For nearly a thousand years, the clans ruled these splendid islands as a Gaelic kingdom apart, neither Scottish nor English, but Highlander. Perhaps it was their fierce independence that kept them from succeeding as a nation. But by the 19th century, the island dynasties had all but vanished, pushed aside by intruding monarchies and sent in search of their fortunes across the Atlantic. Today, two mighty clan castles survive to remind us of the rough-hewn splendor of the Highland clan's golden age. Duart Castle on the island of Mull was the stately stronghold of the Maclean clan, from Duart, the Maclean's waged war on Scotland and England, but saved their most savage campaigns for rival clans. On the island the Vikings named Skye, majestic Dunvegan Castle is the kingly residence of the clan MacLeod. Dunvegan is Scotland's longest continually occupied residence, owing perhaps to the MacLeod's longtime dealings with the little people, the fairies, the isle's fabled source of luck and longevity. Narrowly defined, a clan is a group of kin whose members claim common ancestry. For people around the world who return each year to the Scottish Highlands, a clan is something more. It is a bond to a bygone era of fierce loyalties, blood feuds, and the heartland itself. A place of myth and mystery where the Highland clans were born. According to clan lore, their ancient origins began with the Darkland, 
a world inhabited by magical creatures said to thrive in the islands, the fairies. The fairies, or little people, dwell in nature's between times, dawn and dusk, mist and shadow. Laying eyes on them has brought many a clansman good luck or lifelong torment. On hilltops, the Celts erected the Hebrides' first permanent structures, sometime between 100 and 300 AD. This is a brock, once a 40-foot mountain of stone built around a spacious inner courtyard. From these crude castles, the Celts could wage war on the Picts and protect surrounding villages and herds. They could also put up a staunch defense against more sophisticated invaders arriving by sea, like Roman slave traders, and later the Vikings. The foundation for the wall and the courtyard make up the Brock's simple but effective design. Its defensive wall was really two walls. From walkways built between them, defenders could run to portals overlooking the terrain below. The walkways also provided storage space and insulation against the Hebrides' piercing winds. Among the items stored here would have been the chief's collection of human heads, claimed after battle to garner their strength. By the 5th century AD, the Hebrides' kingdom of Celts had tamed the isles and developed strong defenses against raiders arriving on their shores. In the 6th century, the waves delivered one invader who wasn't after Celt women or their herds. This traveler and his 12 companions would change Celt religious belief forever. He was an Irish priest named Columba, and on the Isle of Iona, he founded the Hebrides Isles' most sacred place. Today, these ornate Celtic crosses mark the site of Columba's original abbey, replaced in the 13th century by a Benedictine monastery. According to legend, when St. Columba founded his abbey, he was met by the island's chief Celtic priests, or Druid. The Druid insisted on being buried alive in the building's foundation as kind of a good luck charm. Before Columba's arrival, Iona had long been a center for pagan ritual. Its Celtic crosses show how sacred pagan shapes celebrating nature and the seasons were tamed within the imposing symbol of the crucifixion. St. Columba Christianized the islands and in the 6th century established Iona as Scotland's foremost center for religious learning. He died in 597 and is said to be buried beneath one of the time-worn stones in the abbey's ancient graveyard. Because of this, Iona became a site of Christian pilgrimage and the burial place for both clan chiefs and early Scottish monarchs. The tombs shed light on the bloody struggles that united the Inner Hebrides under a culture of warriors who arrived by sea. They were the Vikings. The island's peace was shattered in 794 when the fearsome dragon head on the bow of Viking ships turned its horrible gaze upon the Hebrides. At first, the Vikings came merely to plunder, which they did after slaughtering the abbey's monks and island dwellers. By the 10th century, however, they had built a formidable Viking empire off Scotland's western coast. Within a few generations, the islands had worked their magic, and the Norse invaders little resembled their forebears. Most Viking leaders were now Christian, and in their veins, Norse, Celt, and even Pict blood freely mingled. They had become a breed apart and dominated the Hebrides Isles by force of arms. With them begins the story of the Highland clans. The clans were distinct groups of kin who in the island tradition held land in common and were ruled by a chief. Their enemies were pirates, competing clans and any agent of Scotland's crown. Although the Scottish rulers and the clans were not two distant relatives separated by just a little water, their views on government were oceans apart. Scotland was feudal. All lands were royal lands owned by the king. 
This idea clashed violently with the clan's belief in family patriarchy. Castles sprang up throughout the Inner Hebrides to protect the clan way of life. Most have been reduced to ruin, but some still survive. On Mull Island, the clan MacLean built castles by the dozen. Moy Castle is essentially a fortified house, but a big improvement on the earlier Celt brocks. Norse Vikings were the primary influence on its defensive features. According to island lore, its stones came from the castle of a MacLean rival. By the 12th century, the Normans had developed a better design, and on Mull Island, the MacLeans took advantage of it. The clan's Elan Donan castle is a stone version of the mound and courtyard fortresses the Normans used throughout their invasion of the British Isles. How the Maclean's won control of Mull Island is a tale of the Highlands' ever-shifting balance of power. Early in the 14th century, the King of Scotland allied with the clan Donald to try and gain control over the islands. For their loyalty, the clan Donald, later MacDonald, was awarded vast estates throughout the Inner Hebrides. In 1337, John MacDonald inherited these lands and the allegiance of the smaller clans who occupied them. In honor of this, he was given a title the clans devised themselves, Lord of the Isles. In generations to come, the Scottish crown would regret the influence of the Highland kingship they had helped create. John MacDonald, first Lord of the Isles, had cause to regret it much sooner. He was kidnapped by two brothers from the fiercest clan in his domain, the MacLeans. At the point of a sword, they made MacDonald promise two things, forgiveness for having just murdered a rival clan chief, and land. The entire island of Mull, including magnificent Duart Castle, thereby came into possession of the fighting clan MacLean. From a high crag jutting out into the channel between Mull and the mainland, Duart Castle dominated trade between Scotland and the islands. Through medieval times, the MacLeans enmeshed themselves in dozens of bloody inter-clan disputes, as well as the centuries-long struggle between the Highlanders and Scotland's crown. It was during a feud with the McDonald's that the sea brought the McLeans an unexpected treasure. In the midst of the fight, blown off course by a storm, came a galleon from the Spanish Armada. In exchange for their help in fighting the McDonald's, the McLean chief promised the unwitting Spanish that he'd provision their ship. The McLeans provided hostages to seal the bargain. Before the Spanish could return from the fight, their galleon anchored off Duard Castle mysteriously exploded, killing the crew and the McLean hostages on board. Legend has it that the ship was sunk by the MacLeans themselves, so they could recover its treasure with a minimal loss of family members. Upon their return to Duart, the hapless Spanish were imprisoned, and in Duart's dungeon spent the rest of their lives. In the 15th century, clan chief Lachlan MacLean wed a lady from the Campbell clan to cement an alliance with that powerful family. The marriage led to disaster. One story is that his wife Elizabeth carried on a clandestine affair with an English lover. MacLean got wind of the relationship and devised to get rid of his wife without being blamed for her murder. He abandoned Elizabeth Campbell on a rock he knew would be covered by the incoming tide. Fortunately for her, fishermen saw her plight and rescued her from what is now called the Lady's Rock. Elizabeth went to the home of her brother, where Lachlan MacLean turned up the next day to report her death. 
He was knifed in his sleep and promptly found his way back here, the McLean family graveyard, next to Duard Castle. According to many accounts, Lachlan makes an uneasy ghost, disturbing the final rest of all the McLean chiefs, great and small. The clan's proudest era was five centuries ago. Inside Dewart, a collection of artifacts and finery traces McLean history in more modern times. This statuette in Dewart's banqueting hall is the likeness of the clan's most recent chief, Sir Charles Hector McLean. These objects honor clan chiefs past and present. The christening mugs, flasks, and tureens here are gifts from heads of state and McLean clan organizations around the world. Some of the items were presented to Sir Charles Hector McLean in this century for his service to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. No self-respecting clan chief went anywhere without his brooch and dirk. The brooch kept his kilt on, while the dirk, a traditional dagger, kept his enemies at a distance. Today, Duart's era of swordplay is past, and the castle is a place of homage for tourists and clan members in search of their roots. They find them in three centuries of clan leaders whose portraits keep alive the dramatic history of the Maclean's of Duart Castle, the Highlands' fiercest clan. For another of the Inner Hebrides' great castles and great clans, the past is present. Their home is the enchanted Isle of Skye. Clan MacLeod has continuously occupied mighty Dunvegan Castle for the last 750 years. A fortress of some kind has existed here since the time of Christ. The clan founder was Laud, son of one of the region's last Viking kings. Despite centuries of inter-clan warfare and Scotland's attempts to break up the clans, the heirs of Loud held on to Dunvegan against all comers. The strength of the clan chiefs might account for the MacLeod's longevity at Dunvegan, but some say their secret lies in the clan's connection to the Hebrides' fairy kingdom, called the Darkland. In the 18th century, the 23rd chief, Norman, set about enlarging and reconstructing the castle's living quarters, including the dining room and study in Victorian style. The castle's largest suite is the dining room, home to ancestral portraits that cover 300 years of MacLeod family history. These chiefs held power after Scotland had subdued the clans. Notable among them is Flora MacLeod, one of the first women to be named Clan Chief. She founded dozens of MacLeod clan associations worldwide. Guarded in their castle is one of the clan's most powerful treasures, a silver chalice called the Dunvegan Cup. It forms one of the clan's ancient links to the fairy kingdom of Celtic fable. In the land of Mozart stands a mighty castle, a thousand years old, protecting the secrets of holy men and their worldly ways, weathering each century with unconquerable poise, Hohen Salzburg. Within these impenetrable walls unfolded human dramas of religious zeal, cunning politics, and illicit love. Join us as the curtain rises on the passion plays of this Austrian citadel, next on Great Castles of Europe.
Every spring, when the snow melts, the meadows of Austria's Salzburger province turn green once more. The Salzach River carries the icy waters of the Alpine glaciers to the city of Salzburg, named for the salt-rich mines that brought wealth to the region. In this town, layered in Baroque antiquity, Mozart was born, a native son revered to this day, though he himself never cared much for the confines of Salzburg's conservatism. Or perhaps it was this ominous sight, confronted every day, that put a damper on the young maestro's jaunty spirits. Looming imperiously above the city's old quarter stands one of Middle Europe's oldest and largest castles, Hohen Salzburg. Towering 400 feet above the river, the castle casts a daunting silhouette against the sky, an arresting sight from miles afar. The castle is 900 years old, a symbol of medieval grandeur, a powerful statement of military might, lorded over by a handful of religious monarchs, the archbishops who governed the region during the reign of the Holy Roman Empire. The twelve archbishops who oversaw the castle for eight centuries were a motley sort. Some dedicated to matters of God and spirit, others who pursued more earthly delights, such as wealth, women, and war. They were a remarkable study in contrast and contradiction, whose stories spoke of arrogance and impudence, secret marriages and secret children, broken hearts and broken lives. Their colorful natures are forever entwined in the history of Hohen Salzburg. For the most part, the archbishops used Hohen Salzburg as a strategic fortress, a way to guard the city and control the trade and traffic that flowed between Italy and southern Germany. Certainly, the castle offered a menacing reminder to any interloper or enemy. Behind every tiny hole or tower window could lurk a set of watchful eyes, hands at the ready with poison-tipped arrows and withering cannon fire. The castle was originally built out of fear. In the year 1077, Archbishop Gebhard von Helfenstein began construction on the site as part of a three-fortress line of defense. During a fierce power struggle between the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor, King Henry IV, the Archbishop had sided with the Pope. The specter of the King's revenge prompted the need to shore up his defenses. In the early days, Hohen Salzburg looked much like the castle equivalent of a wooden shack, its simple construction made not of stone, but of wood. The man largely responsible for transforming Hohen Salzburg into an impenetrable fortress was the Archbishop Leonard von Koitschak. Ruler of Salzburg in the early 16th century, von Koitschak chose to live at Hohen Salzburg, the only Archbishop to prefer the castle's isolation over the hustle and bustle of the Salzburg city. Of course, other archbishops also lived here, but most of them divided their time between the castle on the hill and their mansions in town. It was von Koitschak who oversaw the construction of the castle's towers and defenses, giving it the impressive and forbidding posture it still holds today. The archbishop left his mark everywhere. His inscriptions and his coat of arms, bearing a sugar beet, are scattered throughout. Fifty-eight sugar beets in all. Von Koitschak's uncle is memorialized in this vegetable. He was a simple farmer who profoundly influenced the archbishop. Following an argument between uncle and nephew, the future churchman traded in his reckless days of youth full of drunken escapades, and retreated to the castle to live a pious existence. 
von Korczak was a prickly, complicated archbishop whose harsh rule and deeply religious convictions did not endear him to the townsfolk. Few, though, would be foolish enough to test his ill temper or strength. He once disciplined a contrary servant by dangling him outside a castle window. Von Korczak was also a stickler for order and discipline. He felt it his responsibility to wake the people of Salzburg every morning. He accomplished this by building an automated organ with a repertoire of melodies. It plays to this day music by the Mozarts, both father and son, and Joseph Haydn. Each melody ends with a startling roar, giving the instrument its name, the Salzburg Steer. During his days at Hohen Salzburg, von Koitschak oversaw an extensive expansion that included the construction of several new buildings, among them a granary, brewery, weapon depots, a hospital, prison cells, dormitories, and of course, a chapel. Called St. George's Church, it houses life-size marble reliefs of the apostles, dressed like archbishops. The castle's expansion was a daunting, laborious task. Each boulder had to be hauled up the treacherous hill by oxen, horses, and prisoners. Von Koitschak grew impatient and ordered his engineers to invent a more efficient technique. The result, a cable car, one of the first in Austria. The cart ran on rails, pulled along by animals and men. Called the Long Journey, the cart passed through four solid walls of defense, each heavily guarded and closed off by a set of heavy doors. Traveling uphill, von Koitschak could keep an eye on progress. Under his direction, Hohen Salzburg grew from a simple wooden fortress to a 250-room stronghold that could, in times of tension, house 7,000 soldiers. A shrewd politician, von Koitschak consolidated great power over the Salzburger lands. He saw the castle as a symbol of his political and military strength. That strength was tested only once, with quite surprising results. Perhaps it was here, while looking over the city of Salzburg, that von Kurchak first heard the dangerous rumblings of rebellion from the townsfolk. Relations between the archbishop and the town had always been strained. With its own city council and mayor, Salzburg enjoyed its independence and looked on von Korczak as a threat. By the 16th century, the city had grown rich from the thick veins of silver, gold, and salt that ran through the surrounding region. As the wealth grew, so did tensions. Whoever held political power also controlled the flourishing economy. On January 23, 1511, the city council of Salzburg voted to oust Archbishop von Korczak. But the archbishop was not a man to be trifled with. Without wasting a moment, the archbishop invited the entire council and the mayor to feast at his downtown residence. All his enemies attended, the council members, mayor, the city's secretary, even the judge, Spirits ran high, everyone certain that von Koitschak would have in hand a peace treaty to be negotiated over a good meal. 
But before his guests could manage their first bite, von Koitschak took them hostage. He would not release them until they ceded all city rights in perpetuity. The city lost its mayor and city council for good. It would never regain its autonomy, and the people of Salzburg would look up at the castle with hatred. For all his heavy-handed politics, von Koitschak's aesthetic style was quite delightful. The archbishop oversaw the construction of the sumptuous staterooms. His bedroom is a good example of the rich Gothic design of the era. The best wood carvers of the Salzburger land were chosen to craft the fine details. Apart from the gold-imprinted leather walls, the rooms have been preserved in their original state. Remarkably, in its 900-year history, Hohen Salzburg has remained unscathed by war, one of the few castles of Europe to hold that distinction. Its defenses were first tested in 1525, when the simmering frustration of the people of Salzburg finally boiled over. After centuries of uneventful intimidation, its garrisoned forces had to prove their mettle. It promised to be a baptism of fire. Much of Salzburg's seething discord was fueled during the reign of von Koitschak, who had stripped the city of its power and privilege 14 years earlier. Von Koitschak's successor, Archbishop Motheus Lahm, followed up with a measure of impudence. He named one of the castle's great watchtowers the Mayor's Tower to mock the now mayorless city. His audacious act would not go unanswered. On the 25th of May, 1525, tens of thousands of city dwellers and farmers descended on the castle, screaming for an independent government and a return of Salzburg's privileges. But the fortifications built by von Koitschak held their own against the uprising. As the frustrated rebels did not dare attack the castle's defenses, they cut a tunnel out of the rock below and filled it with gunpowder. But the meager explosion made not a dent. Hohen Salzburg, their much hated symbol, simply rested on its rock, unfazed. The siege lasted the length of the summer of 1525. For the soldiers inside the castle, it was a season of boredom, spent watching the agitated rebels trying to work their pitiful wooden cannons, which often backfired. The rebellion eventually collapsed on itself. Its only reminder, the scar of cannon fire inside the reception room. After the uprising, Hohen Salzburg gradually faded in importance. Successive archbishops were drawn to the city and built homes and palaces in the town and nearby countryside. One archbishop in particular adored Salzburg and greatly influenced its architectural style. Wolf Dietrich von Reitenau was a Renaissance man with strong ties to Italy. Raised in Rome during the 16th century, he fell under the powerful spell of Medici Florence. The archbishop held similar aspirations for Salzburg and did his best to transform the city into his own version of the Italian Renaissance, a Rome of the north. His crown jewel, the Mirabel Palace. Wolf Dietrich built this home in 1606 for his beloved mistress, the beautiful Salome Alt. She bore the archbishop 15 children, and he later secretly married her. One might suppose that rumors of a Catholic archbishop fathering children and marrying a Jewish woman would have reached the Vatican, but they didn't. It was war that actually exposed Wolf Dietrich's secret. The archbishop waged an ill-fated turf battle with neighboring Bavaria over salt deposits. The war ended in the archbishop's capture. Bavaria handed Wolf Dietrich over to the pope, who promptly imprisoned him after learning of his marriage. 
Wolf Dietrich was jailed at Hohen Salzburg, a prisoner, in fact, of his own castle. Stripped of his position, Wolf Dietrich was now the ward of his nephew, the new archbishop, Marcus Siticus, who ignored his uncle's pleas for freedom. In 1617, after five years of imprisonment, Wolf Dietrich died, legend says, of a broken heart. Wolf Dietrich was the only prisoner of Hohen Salzburg considered a celebrity. The others who filled the castle prison cells proved rather dull in comparison, ordinary poachers and common heretics. There is a torture room at Hohen Salzburg that sits above the dungeon. It is, however, a piece of 20th century artifice. These unpleasant devices are imports from downtown, where they were put to quite effective use, one imagines, in the city jail. But the dungeon was always at Hohen Salzburg, a dreary holding tank for prisoners through the centuries. It sank 16 feet deep. The bottom could be reached only by a rope that ran across the beams above. The dungeon walls are covered with engravings. Some resemble calendars, vertical lines scratched out to account for days past. Other etchings depict houses and names, perhaps desperate attempts to hold on to one's identity or keep a fierce grip on sanity, as prisoners would be kept here in the dark for at least six weeks before questioning even began. As the 17th century progressed, Hohen Salzburg lost much of its significance, while the archbishops built livelier homes in and around town. Most notable was the Helbrun Palace, built by Marcus Siticus. Like much of Salzburg, the palace showed a strong Medici streak. The villa and gardens clearly resembled the style of Frascati and Tivoli. And inside Hohen Salzburg, life continued, but now without archbishops. Within the gloomy confines of Hohen Salzburg lived only soldiers who battled mostly against their own boredom. By the 18th century, the fortress had lost much of its military character. The archbishops no longer wielded political influence, and new arms and war strategies had rendered the fortress defenses obsolete. The spiritual life at the castle suffered too. An 18th century chaplain wrote, the fortress now counts 341 souls, of which only seven are baptized. I am worried about the carelessness of the parents. I only see strangers in church. The fortress soon fell into disrepair. But fortunately, plans to demolish the structure were interrupted in the mid-19th century when preservationists moved to make the fortress a museum, a medieval relic of a colorful and turbulent past. Anyone today can trace the footsteps of the archbishops, their pious ways, and their trespasses. This secret staircase ends not far from the castle. Legend has it that the hidden passage was built and used by one of the archbishops for clandestine meetings with his concubines in town. For more than a hundred years now, visitors have come to Hohen Salzburg to plunge into the lives and adventures of such characters as Wolf Dietrich and von Koitschak. To explore the secret pits and passages of this medieval wonder. And to better learn the compelling drama of passion, 
politics and religion that ran from the early Middle Ages to the late Renaissance. France's Anjou province in the year 1020. At the meeting place of four ancient trade routes at a ford in the river Touay, a nobleman warrior builds a stronghold from which to crush his enemies. He is Folk Nara, burner of monasteries, plunderer of hamlets. For a dark complexion and darker deeds, he has earned the name Folk the Black. Before the mysterious folk vanishes from history, he bloodies the Loire Valley in a campaign of dominion. With 20 forts, he stakes his claim to Anjou province and writes the first dark chapter in the history of Montreuil. No citadel in the region is feared or coveted like Montreuil, literally, the hill by the river. For tyrants, it is a stronghold. For their enemies, an obsession. For the next three centuries, the castle on the river Touay will be a bar to peace in Anjou. Cunning as a snake, greedy as a wolf, ferocious as a lion. Thus, the chronicles of Meron Describe the castle's next master, Giro II, fifth lord of Belay. Perhaps Folk's darkest deed is to grant Montreuil to the rapacious Belay clan. In two centuries in their hands, it evolves into one of the most ingenious fighting castles of its age. And with it, its master Giro terrorizes the province. For two decades, Montreuil is Giraud's unbreachable lair, until the summer of 1149. Bowing to end this reign of terror, Anjou's new count, Geoffrey the Handsome, lays siege to the castle. Repelled time and again, his band of nobles probe the stronghold for a flaw in its armor. But the besiegers find none. The northwest face is doubly guarded by the river Touay and a sheer cliff. Attack here is suicide. Capped with crenellated turrets, two great towers rise more than a hundred feet over the river. Giraud's archers firing through arrow slits make the most of its bristling defenses. A moat named the Valley of Judah guards the castle's ramparts, almost ten feet thick. From this wall and the ramparts' crow's nests, archers blunt any assault. The main entrance is the Count's only hope, yet its defenses make it a besieger's nightmare. Mounted knights have no chance of forcing the gates of the massive Barbican, nearly a fortress in itself. Its walls are pitted and bruised by catapults, but no stone can bring them down. The Barbican's half-circle face gives defending archers a 180-degree field of fire, as well as a high platform for catapults. Even if captured, the Barbican cannot be kept. Its rear face is open, exposed to fire from the castle.
And when besiegers stormed the Barbican and tried to rush the gate, they fell into a trap. The path to the gate is angled, exposing attackers' flanks to more archers on the wall and inside the tower. By some accounts, the siege drags on for a year. Others claim three. Desperate, Geoffrey builds two high wooden towers, which he mans with archers and wheels up to the ramparts. But here, Giraud's archers and pikemen once again shatter his attack. In frustration, Geoffrey the Handsome abandons the frontal assault. But in an ancient Roman treatise on war, he finds a new tactic. For months, his men have pummeled Montreuil with stones fired from the fearsome trebuchet, the Middle Ages' most deadly siege machine. The basis of the catapult is the pendulum arm, set in motion by a counterweight. A rope frees the counterweight, and the pendulum lashes out. A sling attached to the end of the weapon doubles its firing range. Yet under this deadly rain, Montreuil remains undaunted, owing to the castle's ultimate defense, a network of tunnels leading from its cellar to the town of Montreuil. Through them, Giraud smuggles in supplies. Finally, Geoffrey the Handsome takes the Roman historian's advice and creates a bomb made of iron and filled with boiling oil. This he launches at the castle's keep. The keep bursts into flames. According to the Chronicle of Meron, Giraud and his men emerged from their lair like reptiles. Geoffrey throws them in irons. Then he flattens the castle's main tower, breaking the mighty fortress at last. In France's graceful Loire Valley in the 15th century, Castles are changed into palaces by aristocrats more interested in the art of living than the art of war. On the eve of the French Renaissance, the Hundred Years' War with England is at last drawing to a close. As some tell it, Providence smiled on Anjou by killing off the Belay clan and bringing here gentler nobles. Still, in 1438, the mighty fortress on the river Touay bears the cutthroat's name, Montreuil Belay. Its new owner, William of Harcourt, Baron of Montreuil, proves to be the castle's greatest patron. He comes from a long line of benefactors and builders, which sadly will die out with him. Yet to the Harcourt's 71-year reign, the castle owes its transformation from fighting fortress to Renaissance chateau. The new Montreuil Ballet is a suite of buildings that celebrate the Renaissance value of the vertical. While Montreuil Ballet's earlier owners had skulked underground, the Harcourts strive toward heaven. The central tower, whose windows are adorned with crosses, stretches six stories high. The windows the Harcourts introduced to Anjou are more than a luxurious homage to fresh air and sunlight. They are big and indefensible. 
more evidence that the castle's fighting days are behind it. During the Harcourt's reign, the central courtyard is the staging area for construction throughout the castle. Building is the aristocracy's way of trumpeting their fame, while fulfilling their duty to employ the peasantry. In the kitchen, enlarged by the Harcourts, servants prepare meals for about 60 residents daily. On special occasions, this number can reach a thousand. In the 15th century, the castle's menu consists mainly of bread, boiled vegetables, and roasted meat. Several huge chimneys ensure adequate ventilation for fires that must be constantly stoked. In the Harcourt's day, a covered passageway connects the kitchen to the new castle's main tower. Inside it is what may be the widest spiral staircase in France. In all, the castle boasts 18 staircases. For the Harcourts, the dining room, not the battle towers, is the center of the genteel household. The baron, whose coat of arms hangs above the mantel, extends his generosity beyond the castle walls. During his reign, Montre gains a hospital for the poor. His philanthropy is partly inspired by his devout wives. Harcourt twice marries to Christian brides, who fill the castle with images and illustrations of medieval faith. Hobgoblins and tortured penitents warn of the fate awaiting sinners in the hereafter. The Harcourts hold services for the family in the private chapel. Its faded decoration was probably inspired by the Book of Hours. This illustrated prayer book is the Middle Ages' most popular text for private worship. From its words, wealthy noblemen commission elaborate illustrated manuscripts. For the chapel's rare painted ceiling, the Harcourts commission angels with string, wind, and percussion instruments. Their faded gold leaf wings are made from peacock feathers. Near the angels is the music they are to perform, a quatrain for female voices composed by a Scottish monk. To preside in the collegiate church and private chapel, the Harcourts employ an order of priests called canons. The four highest ranking live in the castle's most unusual addition, the Petit Chateau, built sometime after 1450. In creating the chateau, the Harcourts' piety reaches uncommon heights. Ensconced in the four towers of the chateau, known as the canons' lodgings, the priests follow their devotions undisturbed. In each tower, a spiral staircase leads to rooms for sleep and study. Near the end of Harcourt's 50 years as baron, construction halts for lack of funds. His waning fortunes are betrayed by the main tower's stonework. On the upper floors, the facades are austere. In contrast to the ornate lower floors, which display the heraldry. The main entrance was meant for a fireplace and chimney. Later owners would convert the portal into a Renaissance door and window.
1488, the Harcourt line dies out. Yet their legacy of devotion endures through the next seasons of the castle's life, which will never again be as contented. Following the Harcourt's reign, Anjou enjoys the protection of France's kings. During the French Revolution, this alliance with the crown becomes a curse. Alone in the region, the castle's collegiate church has survived the wars of religion and the revolution, probably because it has long been open to the people of Anjou. A mourning band commemorates the lords of Montreuil entombed in the sanctuary. During the revolution, it was painted over to keep the church from being destroyed. The reign of terror that sends the king to the guillotine makes prisoners of 300 women from provinces nearby. For their loyalty to King Louis, the women are crowded into the castle's cellars and caves. When typhus breaks out, most perish. Some are buried in the moat. Others find their way to a common grave beyond the chateau. The townsfolk call it the Ladies' Forest. Traces remain of their anonymous burial, but the identities of the women have been lost. One woman imprisoned in another age casts a lasting spell over the castle with her indomitable spirit, the Duchess de Longueville, known as the soul of the French Civil War. This uprising in 1653 breaks out when the king's regent raises taxes and threatens the power of the aristocracy. The Duchess fuels the rebellion by writing seditious pamphlets and using her beauty to disarm the enemy. On behalf of the king, the powerful Viscount Henri Turenne has been asked to raise an army and crush the civil war. He is seduced by the Duchess. As for the uprising, the Viscount has a change of heart. To punish her meddling, the Prime Minister orders the Duchess confined to remote Montreuil Belay, owned by her husband. With additions to the new castle, his family completes the elegant apartments begun by the Harcourts. The Longueville coat of arms takes its place on the mantel above the Harcourts in the Grand Salon. Here, the new owner's tastes range from classic to Christian. To exercise a voice said to make perfect music, the Duchess de Longueville practices diligently in the chateau's new music room. Yet during her two-year confinement at Montreuil Ballet, she complains of boredom and takes to riding her horse indoors up the castle's main staircase. The Duchess's distraction only conceals the political intriguing she has promised to give up. In Paris, the Prime Minister feels the threat she still presents. To a Spanish ambassador, he remarks, you Spanish have women who are only concerned about making love, but here in France, we have women capable of overthrowing an entire kingdom. A minor actor in the castle's story, the Duchess came to embody Montreuil Ballet, a Renaissance beauty 
with a dangerous past. Yet it is the Harcourts, the family who brought the castle back to life, whose spirit lingers here. 500 years ago, they vanished from Montre Belay, but recently explorers discovered a plaque which points to the castle's catacombs as their burial place. Here they have lain for half a millennia, the soul of Montre Belay resting at its heart. Shimmering waters nourish thriving vineyards, while from its shores, majestic castles lord over every twist and bend. Join us on a journey into Germany's rich medieval past, a voyage through legend on the world's most romantic river, the Rhine, next on Great Castles of Europe. by melting snow fields high in the Swiss Alps, the mighty Rhine carves an 800-mile channel through the heart of Europe. In the Low Countries, it rushes to the sea. Its name comes from the Celtic word for stream, a vast understatement of the romance and power of this mighty river. Writers from Goethe to Mark Twain have tried to capture the Rhine's epic spirit. In 1838, the French novelist Victor Hugo wrote that the Rhine combines everything, winding as the Seine, historic as the Tiber, royal as the Danube, covered with phantoms and fables like a river of Asia. But unlike rivers of any other region, the Rhine is studded with dozens of medieval castles, making it a showplace of antiquity, unequaled in the world. In the 50-mile stretch between Mainz and Koblenz, Germany, some 30 castles and ruins tower above the river's edge. Every bend and coil in the snaking waterway seems to reveal another. Rhine travelers not only get a journey through Europe's heart, but backwards through time itself. These spectacular vistas have survived virtually unchanged since the Middle Ages. By the 13th century, the Rhine had developed into a vital commercial waterway. Its shores were governed by noblemen and Catholic clergy, bitter rivals who fought over every inch of land, especially riverfront property. There, huge profits could be made by erecting toll stations and charging hefty fees for the safe passage of ships. The right to operate a toll castle could be awarded only by the regional lord or the German king, usually in exchange for money or political favors. Merchants had no choice but to pay the charge. Moving their cargo overland was a more dangerous and often deadly ordeal. Here at the city of Kaub, the Rhine narrows like an hourglass, making it an ideal spot for a toll castle. This ship-like fortress was erected by King Ludwig the Bavarian in 1326. He named it Falsgrafenstein. More lyrically, Victor Hugo would call it a stone ship eternally anchored the face of the city. But in the 14th century, the powerful Catholic Church regularly shipped goods along the Rhine. They took a dimmer view. Pope John XXII condemned King Ludwig for new and severe impositions for those passing with goods. In 1327, the Bavarian king suffered the ultimate revenge. The Pope excommunicated him. Despite its jaunty nautical appearance, the castle Falsgrafenstein was built for extortion. No royal personage ever took residence here. Instead, a regiment of some 30 soldiers kept a round-the-clock vigil. 
Watchmen announced approaching ships by ringing a bell. The castle's toll rider would board each vessel, examine its cargo, and assess the toll. To keep boats from slipping by unchecked, a canal on the Rhine's east side forced them to pass next to the castle. For merchants trying to run the gauntlet, a watery grave awaited. Huge stones hurled from catapults rained down. Cannons aimed through gun points could target every inch of the river. Here on the castle's west side, the Rhine is rocky. In addition, a heavy chain stretched across the river's width. Wayward ships stranded here were sitting ducks. The troops stationed at Falsgrafenstein did all their fighting from a distance. Their ranks were made of cripples and retirees. Accommodations in the castle were also second rate. All walkways connecting the castle rooms are exposed to the elements. Garrison quarters inside are Spartan but functional. Built into a watchtower suspended over the Rhine, this rudimentary toilet empties straight into the water. The ship like Falsgrafenstein heads ceaselessly into the current, but its seafaring design was only partly for show. Six watchtowers add strength to its river battered ramparts. Its bow continues to protect the toll castle from rising currents and ice flows even today. The Rhine's history is inextricably linked with the fruit for which it became famous. Succulent wine grapes probably grew wild in this valley long before mankind learned of their giddy magic. As early as the time of Christ, Rhine wine was shipped to discriminating consumers as far off as England and Scandinavia. In time, the nectar of the vine made this valley rich, or rather it enriched those who owned the toll castles and vineyards. To further line their coffers, these rulers taxed the peasants who worked their fields. Commoners handed over the lion's share of everything they produced, a tariff usually paid in wine. As for the peasants, the wine they manufactured gave them cause to celebrate, socialize, and forget. popular intoxicant became the accepted payment for all river tolls. One barrel of wine was worth 16 pounds of garlic or grapes or six baskets of fish. Its use as a standard of exchange accounts in part for Rhine wine's development into a thriving industry. As wine became the favorite currency of kings, castle wine cellars filled to overflowing. But with the frequent festivities and celebrations that characterized Rhine court life, these vast supplies quickly ran out again. In addition to fine wines, the Rhine gave birth to epics of heroism and valor. At a place called Dragon's Rock, the legendary prince Siegfried used an enchanted sword to slay a fire-breathing beast. By bathing in the monster's blood, the prince became invincible. Wagner's famous opera, Ring of the Nibelung, immortalizes the hero, killed finally through the cunning of the jealous Queen Brunhild, who perished with him. To this day, the Lower Rhine's red wine bears the name Dragon's Blood. This region of the Rhine got its name from another tale of feminine guile, 
and the supernatural. Here, the scenic rhine curves sharply, and the swift current grows treacherous. Steep rocks jut skyward from the river's edge. Upon these rocks, according to legend, a woman of otherworldly beauty materialized each evening. Her name was Lorelei, and her sweet, plaintive song deafened boatmen to the river's thundering roar. gained their senses, it was too late. They could no longer steer clear of the rocks, nor keep the jealous waves from swarming the rocks. And the beautiful Lorelei, under the cries of drowning sailors, she continued her siren chanting until the morning sun chased off the night. Travel down the Rhine River today is a floating lesson in medieval rivalry. At every curve, another castle appears high atop the riverbanks. Each represents a landlord's claim to all the territory below. Two castles in particular illustrate the shifting balance of power that once characterized the mighty river region. The castle Teurenburg on the Rhine's east bank was built by the Archbishop of Trier around 1356. Not to be outdone by a churchman, his neighbors, the wealthy counts von Katzenellenbogen, erected their own castle on the opposite hill. These powerful merchants were already the proud owners of 138 villages. Although they named their new prize the Berg nor Katzenellenbogen, it came to be known as the Berg Katz, or Katz Castle. Predictably, the first castle, the Torenberg, was then nicknamed Berg Maus, Mouse Castle. Thus, the antagonism between merchants of great wealth and the all-powerful Catholic Church resembled a game, a cat-and-mouse rivalry that continued through the ages. When they weren't baiting one another or pressing their vassals into service, the lords of the Rhine passed leisurely days with pleasant diversions. Favorite at the Berg Mouse was hunting, using falcons and eagles, a blood sport that originated in the Orient. Survivors of the Crusades and well-traveled merchants like the Katzenellenbogen Counts brought falcons and falconers to Europe and the British Isles. There, the sport thrived among the privileged classes. The quarry these eagles are after are pigeons and other small birds. On the winds of the twisting Rhine Valley, they will soar indefinitely before diving after prey or returning to their master's glove. Katzenellenbogen, who for years used it as their main residence. During an invasion by the French in the late 18th century, peasants with a centuries-old gripe against its owners burned. A few miles downriver, on the east bank of the Rhine, a high, cone-shaped hill rises above the quiet hamlet of Braubach. The castle crowning the hill has an unusually slender keep towering above its attendant courts and ramparts. While it is a massive and presumably easy target, this castle alone among the Rhine landmarks has remained unscathed by enemy attacks. This is the Marksburg. For stability, the Marksburg's walls are triangular and built so close to the hill's edge that in places it's hard to see where the rocks end and the walls begin. Old foundations reveal that the citadel began as a fortified tower, probably built by the 10th century Franks. The Roman-styled central tower was built about 200 years later, 
Subsequent owners of the Marksburg erected an additional defensive wall. Unlike other castles, the Marksburg has survived into the 20th century as more than a ruin or a romantic restoration. Despite additions in the 17th and 18th centuries, its medieval character has been magnificently preserved. The landlord who erected the main buildings in the 13th century was called Eberhard von Katzenellenbogen, another count from the family whose vast influence shaped the history of the Middle Rhine. A canny businessman and trader, he shared his prosperity with the city of Braubach. The castle gave the town much needed employment and most of all protection. This vital function of all medieval castles was acknowledged throughout the continent by friend and foe alike. In a statement of detente between church and state, the Archbishop of Kuhn wrote, Our cities show that their life and belongings are linked with the decline of the castle. Count Eberhardt's generosity at Marksburg was not purely one-sided. He could order Braubach workers to the castle whenever their services were needed. For Eberhardt's court, access to the castle on horseback was a strict necessity. Because of their heavy armor, knights of the era couldn't dismount without help. Without armor, they weren't so encumbered. Marksburg's main entrance was carved out of the slate rock of the mountain itself. Rough-hewn steps prevented horses from slipping during rains. At the end of this stairway lies the Roman palace, the castle's oldest building. Marksburg's central courtyard is remarkably narrow, crowded by the massive Roman tower at its center. Surrounding the courtyard is the Gothic palace built at the end of the 15th century. The palace's sharp roof is protected with slate, excavated for the castle's foundation. Under the castle's second tower lies the spacious Rittersaal, the knight's hall and main living room where official receptions took place. Here Count Eberhard entertained and plotted with the region's noblemen. The hall's massive wall is ten feet thick sturdy enough for even the most determined onslaught by catapult or cannon. Adjoining the Knight's Hall inside the second tower is a striking polygonal chapel spanned by groined vaulting in ten sections. Colorful biblical scenes compete overhead with flattering portraits of knights. The chapel originally was constructed on the east side of the castle. Later it was moved to the castle's south side, its most vulnerable face. God, its builders reasoned, would protect his sanctuary. To help transfer the Holy Spirit to the new chapel site, these ceremonial heads were also moved. They represent the seven deadly sins expiated only through prayer. This portrait depicts St. Mark, he played a vital role in the legend that gave the fortress its name. Long ago, Elizabeth, a maiden of the castle, became secretly engaged to a knight called Siegbert. When Siegbert went to war on behalf of his king, Elizabeth waited for him, but in vain. Word came that in a gruesome battle, her victim had been killed. In her grief, Elizabeth was comforted by a stalwart monk called Marcus. Soon a mysterious knight named Rokas appeared, asking for Elizabeth's hand. Reluctantly, she agreed to be wed, and the kingdom celebrated the nuptials, all except for the monk, Marcus. He was suspicious of the mysterious Rokas and prayed for guidance. On the night before the wedding, Marcus had a strange and disturbing vision. In a flash of blinding light, he saw Mark the Apostle Cross, he told the royal monk that Rokas was the devil himself. He must be banished from the castle. In the morning, Rokas 
and Elizabeth were to come to the chapel. Marcus waited for just the right moment. The demon screamed. Beneath him, the earth opened wide. The Apostle Mark appeared once again to protect the mortals with a holy sword. Since that day, Schloss Braubach has won the name of the saint, Marksburg. Centuries later, in 1937, St. Mark made another appearance at the castle. An American tourist paused to take a snapshot near a chapel window. When the film was developed, this ghostly portrait emerged. Perhaps it was the vigilant St. Mark still defending the Marksburg. In the 14th century, the already formidable influence of the von Katzenellenbogen family grew unchecked. Their toll castles choked the Rhine from Mainz to the Dutch border. The Marksburg was just one of dozens. Chief of the von Katzenellenbogen clan was Philip the Elderly, an adventurous, if aged, bon vivant. Even in his twilight years, he craved parties, the hunt, and adventure. Yet at home, Philip was locked in a stormy marriage to Anna von Wuttemberg. Perhaps this accounts for his far-ranging travels to exotic cities in Africa and China. Eventually, Philip sent Anna to one of his distant castles. Later, he divorced her. At the time, divorce was such a sensitive matter that the church reserved it for the rich and mighty. One of Philip's sons was murdered by a robber. The other succumbed to a mysterious disease. Philip, at 72, faced his life's greatest challenge, producing a new heir. He married once more to another Anna, this one from the von Braunschweig family. She was just 20 years old. But the union was fruitless. And when he died in 1479, there was no male von Katzenellenbogen to carry on the family name. His beloved castle, Marksburg, fell into the hands of his son-in-law, Heinrich von Hessen. But with their own castle far away, the von Hessens had only a fleeting interest in the Marksburg. They visited long enough to pay their respects to the fallen lord, then stripped the castle of its valuables, including Philip's extensive library and treasures of silver and gold. Still seeking profit in the majestic relic, they built an out the castle as a troop garrison. No nobleman would ever live here again. Marksburg's years as a regal showplace had ended. An era had come to a close. The decline of all the great Rhine castles began in earnest shortly after, as the 16th century got underway. With the region shattered by wars, many castles were crippled or destroyed. Their once mighty ramparts and towers were no match for the explosive weapons of the frightening new age. Yet perhaps due to its fearsome appearance and the knowledge that its new cannon batteries were trained constantly on the world below, the Marksburg was left in peace. Only recently, after more than a thousand years unscathed, did the great castle endure its darkest moments. In 1945, while occupied by retreating German troops, it came under American grenade fire. Its wounds, however, were minor. Perhaps once more, St. Mark lent a hand in protecting the stronghold, leaving the greatest treasure of the Rhine intact to this day. Today, the Rhine region hosts adventurers of a different sort. Still proud castles are now home to hotels where travelers can bask in an era of knights, scoundrels, and legends. But the best views are still from the water. Boats navigate a course unchanged by time. Only the panorama changes as the gently snaking valley reveals one treasure after another, and history is turned back by the ceaseless current of the Rhine. Yeah.